Quantum mechanics is one of the most successful theories in the history of physics. It is incredibly accurate in describing the behavior of particles at the smallest scale and has led to countless technological advancements. But why do we often hear from the physicists that nobody understands it? As physicist Richard Feynman famously quoted, I think I can safely say that nobody really understands quantum mechanics. So what aspect of quantum mechanics is that we don't understand? Physicists have a great mathematical apparatus in quantum mechanics to make predictions. And these predictions have been confirmed by numerous experiments. But this mathematical apparatus doesn't provide us with ontology. Or to put this in another way, about what it is a representation of in our physical world. Even if there have been answers to this question, there hasn't been a general agreement in the physics community. Let us make the problem precise. In textbook quantum mechanics, the physical state of the system is represented by a complex valued function, the wave function. And the Schrodinger equation tells us how this wave function evolves in time. At this point, it is natural to ask, what, if anything, does the wave function ascribed to the system represent? Does it represent anything physically real? If not, what else is there? It is exactly these ontological questions that the textbook quantum mechanics fails to provide the answers. Pioneers of quantum physics like Bohr and Heisenberg adopted a radical approach to this issue. Before the advent of quantum mechanics, the goal of physics was to offer a comprehensive, philosophically realistic depiction of all aspects of nature, aiming to directly articulate the true nature of the world. However, Bohr and his contemporaries soon realized that no scientific inquiry could truly reveal the essence of the world. Instead, we could only discuss what we could measure. Representing the world scientifically required defining a boundary between the observer and the observed. This boundary held an inherent mystery or subjectivity. Consequently, questions that once seemed logical about the physical nature of the world were deemed either unaskable or, even worse, unintelligible. So why was it necessary to establish a boundary between the observer and the observed? Let's have a look at it, in particular the linear structure of Schrodinger equation and this will naturally lead us to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Linearity, which is a simple mathematical property, is at the heart of measurement problem. Don't worry about the math. It is not that difficult. At the heart of quantum mechanics, every quantum state is described by an abstract yet mysterious quantity called a wave function. These wave functions change in time based on external effects. The job of the Schrodinger equation is to describe how exactly these quantum wave functions change in time. Schrodinger equation is a linear equation. This means linear combination or superposition of different solutions to the Schrodinger equation is again a valid solution. It is exactly this linearity property that gives all the headaches. Linearity is contagious. Anything that comes in contact with the superposition state must also end up being in the superposition state. Mathematically, if vector A evolves to A prime and vector B evolves to B prime, then if the evolution is linear, the superposition of A and B evolves into A prime plus B prime. This fact that the Schrodinger equation is linear has a significant consequence in the foundation of quantum mechanics. To demonstrate that, we borrow a simple thought experiment from David Albert's Quantum Mechanics and Experience book, published in 1992. The device from the book is called the X-spin detector, with an opening where electrons may enter and a pointer that can point to one of three labels. Ready, indicating the system is prepared to take a new measurement, spin up, indicating the system it has measured has a spin-up, and spin-down indicating the system it has measured has a spin-down. The up and down are in the X direction. With this experimental setup, the machine is ready and receives an electron with an X spin-up. The machine particle system will evolve into a state 
where the machine's pointer will read spin-up, and the electron will remain in the spin-up state. And, if the device in the ready state receives an electron in spin-down, then the machine particle system will evolve into a state in which the machine's pointer will read spin-down, and the electron will remain in the spin-down state. Now, instead of feeding the X-spin detector a particle spinning in the X-direction, we feed it an electron spinning in the Z-direction. In quantum mechanics, an electron in an up state of Z-spin can be rewritten as a superposition of up and down X-spin states. It then follows from what we know about our detector and the linearity of the central dynamical law of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, that our system will evolve into a state in which the machine's pointer will be in the superposition state of finding the electron in the superposition state of being spin up and of being spin down. Linearly is contagious. Anything that comes in contact with the superposition state must also end up being in the superposition state. Now, the trouble is, has anyone ever observed a measuring device particle system in such a state? What would it look like to observe a measuring device in some superposition of pointing in two places? The prediction is not simply absurd, but totally wrong. This is not what we observe in the world. Instead, we observe either the measuring device measuring the electron in spin-down direction with an approximate frequency of 50% or the measuring device measuring the electron in the up direction with an approximate frequency of 50%. Here, we have reached a version of the measurement problem. Schrodinger developed a thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, to illustrate that this can't possibly be right. If the rules of quantum mechanics are to be believed, then we must go into the superposition state of finding the superposition state of a cat being alive and dead after we open the box. But we always see either a cat being alive or dead. How did the pioneers of quantum mechanics match the observations with their theory then? Well, they introduced a collapse postulate. If you measure a physical quantity, then the state of the system collapses to the special state called eigenstate, corresponding to the measured outcome. Mathematically, the measurement process is described by a Hermitian matrix, and the quantum state described by a vector collapses to the eigenstate of the Hermitian matrix. The outcome of the measurement experiment is called eigenvalue. If orthodox quantum mechanics is correct, then all processes in the world may be divided into two fundamental types. Process one, in which a measurement is taking place, and process two, in which a measurement is not taking place. This formulation runs afoul of the measurement problem since it is not clear exactly what physical conditions are required for a measurement to occur. John Bell, originator of Bell's theorem, was particularly worried of this weird scenario. On the paper, Subject and Object, he illustrates this problem as follows. It would seem that the theory is exclusively concerned about the results of measurements and has nothing to say about anything else. What exactly qualifies some physical systems to play the role of measurer? Was the wave function of the world waiting to jump for thousands of millions of years until a single-celled living creature appeared? Or did it have to wait a little longer for some better qualified system with a PhD? If the theory is to apply to anything but highly idealized laboratory operations, are we not obliged to admit that more or less measurement-like processes are going on more or less all the time, more or less everywhere? Do we not have jumping then all the time? So, if it is not the measurement, how is it that the electron comes into the definite position from the indefinite position? Can a measurement or the measuring apparatus, which is made of the fundamental things, can be given the status in the fundamental theory? Or it is that the electron always has a definite position. It is just that we are lacking the complete description of the electron. We will explore the answers to these questions in our upcoming videos.